struggled with addiction yourself. So take us back in time. How did you get addicted to uh, opioids? You know, for me, it started with a hiking injury back uh, in the early 2000 and 2003. I was out with my roommate right outside Washington, D.C. at a trail called the Billy Goat Trail, which is a steep trail. Um, and I slipped and I fell and I fell really hard. I injured my uh, ankle. I split my kneecap and I ended up in the care of an urgent care physician uh, right outside Maryland. And when I saw the doc family that created Purdue, the Sackler family. Then there was a doctor who was selling controlled substances to kids. 16 of his patients had died of overdoses. Plus, if you want to know what evil really looks like, have a Zoom call with a member of the Sackler family. That's today. Welcome to the doctors. Joining me today is my good friend, psychiatrist, Dr. Dominic Sportelli. How are you, doc? Oh, I'm doing great, doc. Pleasure to be with you today. All right, this is a tough subject. Opioid-related drug overdose deaths hit a record high in the U.S. during the pandemic, mainly fueled by fentanyl. But what birthed this public health crisis? Well, Hulu's new series, Dope Sick depicts how one pharmaceutical company triggered the worst drug epidemic in American history. Take a look. Many of my patients are minors. This is dangerous work, and they carry the burden of building this nation on their backs. They're in pain. These people, my people, trusted me. I can't believe how many of them. something that could be big. Oxycontin. Purdue Pharma, they've been marketing the drug as something that's not addictive when it clearly is. All your doctors are going to be asking, how is this even possible? Your most effective talking point are these magic words. Less than 1%. Less than 1%. Less than 1%. Less than 1%. They told me that less than 1% would become addicted. Purdue continues to lie about the drug's safety doctors, patients, and the FDA. We have a major case here. Addiction rates, overdoses, and crime are on the rise across the country because of this drug. It's crucial they understand we've created the greatest painkiller in the history of human civilization. This is the biggest drug in the world. If you haven't checked out Dope Sick on Hula, you really should. It gives you great insight to the opioid crisis and what came down. In fact, Purdue Pharma filed for bankruptcy following widespread corruption. And joining us now is an insider from the bankruptcy proceedings and author of the book, Unsettled how the Purdue Pharma bankruptcy failed the victims of the American overdose crisis. Please welcome Ryan Hampton to the show. How are you, Ryan? Good. Thanks for having me. Besides being an insider, you also struggled with addiction yourself. So take us back in time. How did you get addicted to uh, opioids? You know, for me, it started with a hiking injury back uh, in the early 2000 and 2003, I was out with my roommate right outside Washington, D.C. at a trail called the Billy Goat Trail, which is a steep trail. Um, and I slipped and I fell and I fell really hard. I injured my uh, ankle. I split my kneecap and I ended up in the care of an urgent care physician uh, right outside Maryland. And when I saw the doctor for the first time, she said, look, you're going to need to get that uh, ankle checked out. Eventually, you may need to get some surgery on the knee. Um, but in the meantime, here's a prescription to help with the pain. Um, and I honestly had no idea what I was getting. I had to check, look at, research it when I got home. And what she prescribed me was Dilaudid, uh, which at the time I didn't know was another Purdue product. Now, the nexus of this story was I didn't get the surgery right away, um, but what I did get 
uh, was another prescription and another prescription and another prescription uh, from that doctor to manage the pain. Around this time, you know, my father had passed away. And so I went back home uh, to be closer to my family and to work uh, closer to home, which was South Florida. And if you know anything about the current day overdose crisis, the opioid crisis, you would know that South Florida was just this breeding ground uh, for what we know as pill mills, uh, pain specific clinics and pharmacies. And when I got to South Florida, I um, went to go visit my primary care physician and I said, doc, I've got this problem with my knee and my ankle. And I had legitimate pain at the time. And he said, look, I don't um, work in that type of practice. Uh, you're going to need to see a pain doctor and there's plenty of them. And he said, you could find them in the back of the Miami New Times, which was a daily newspaper. And that's what I did. I found uh, a pain specific doctor. Uh, I went to the doctor's uh, office on my first visit. Uh, I was prescribed Oxycontin for the first time. Uh, the doctor said, look, there's something you can take um, less times a day. You may only need to take it once or twice a day. Uh, the you know, likelihood of, of you getting addicted um, is less than 1%, just like we heard uh, on that clip. Um, and that's what I did. I trusted my doctor. She said, uh, if you know you experience any type of dependence, that's all it is. It's dependence. It may look like addiction, but it's not addiction. Um, it's something maybe called pseudo addiction. But eventually, over time, as I was, I was dealing with the trauma of my father's death and the move and things that were going on in my own life, that medication wasn't just curing the uh, physical pain for me, it also started to cure the emotional pain that I was having uh, as a human. And my use turned into overuse and turned into misuse. And I needed more medication. And as I needed more medication, uh, my doctors, instead of quite the pain doctors, instead of saying, hey, you might have an issue here, they said the solution was always to taper me up give me more, which would solve the problem. Ryan, thank you so much for, for coming in and sharing your story because coming from someone who is in the trenches every day in this, I do detox, I do re rehabilitation, I do medication assisted therapy for people, right? I've had opioid dependence in my own family. I've had patients die from overdose. I am in the trenches. And Ryan, honestly, we need you. We need you out there doing this advocacy work. And so thank you. You know, let's talk a little bit about why this is. Look, when you take an opiate, well, first of all, I want to say one thing. We need opiates, right? As doctors, Dr. Ordman would agree. Doc, you wouldn't be able to do surgery without opiates, of right? We need opiates, and opiates have changed medicine for the better. We need them, right? But when you take an opiate, we need to understand what happens physiologically. You take an opiate, it relieves your pain. It binds to opioid receptors in the brain. The issue is that not only do they relieve pain, they have an analgesic effect, but they also bind to opiate receptors that cause euphoria. So they make us feel so good. They can make us feel relaxed and calm. And Ryan, as you said, you lost your dad. You were in a stressful circumstance. It made it all go away, probably. I could only imagine that that pill probably melted all of that discomfort away temporarily, right? But what happens in the brain and the body is that we develop a tolerance. And what that means is we need more and more and more to get the same effect. So the next thing you know, you're taking more just to feel normal. And then you stop, God forbid you stop, you run out of pills, your doc stops prescribing, you feel so horrible. And I see this every day. Until you've seen someone in the fetal position on the floor, vomiting on themselves with diarrhea, shaking with the worst anxiety they've ever had, then you can't speak to this. It's a horrific thing. And now you're trapped. Yep. Now you're trapped. And, and Ryan, we understand a few years later, Florida, like so many other states out, out there, started cracking down on the oxy prescriptions, the oxy prescriptions that you were getting through the pill mills. What happened next? In 2008 in Florida, you know, I had been seeing this doctor, several doctors actually at this time, because I was, you know, sh I was doctor shopping. I needed more medication. The state decided that they were going to fix this problem. And their 
solution at the time uh, was a monitoring database, right? It was the first iteration of what we now know as the physician drug monitoring database, the PDMP. So I had showed up to my doctor, one of my doctors in 2008, who, by the way, was also misusing Oxycontin and prescriptions and had an addiction themselves and showed up and, and she said, uh, Ryan, uh, you're seeing too many doctors. You're getting too much medication. The, the state of Florida has this new law. You're a drug seeker. You're a junkie. If you show up here again, you'll be arrested. I'm going to put a trespass order out for you. And by the way, you can't see any other doctors in the state of Florida. Now, when I, like the doc just said, my brain at this point was completely hijacked. I was in full blown withdrawal with all symptoms. When I showed up to that doctor's office, I needed my medication. I was having bouts of homelessness at this time. Um, I was not employed. Um, the devastation of addiction had just taken over my life. My entire reward system was hijacked in my brain and I was in survival mode and I needed that medication. This wasn't just happening to me. It was happening to tens of thousands of people just like me across the state of Florida and probably uh, across the nation. Um, and I was offered heroin for the first time. I walked right out into the parking lot and there was somebody there who said, it's cheaper, it'll solve your problem of being sick, and let me take care of you. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So, Brian, tell us, what happened as a result of your heroin use? Well, I mean, it was not a protracted journey um, after that day to multiple overdoses, um, complete homelessness, absolute despair. Um, I... Uh, had no place to live. I was unemployable. I had no insurance. Um, I didn't know what to do. Um, I lost connection with uh, any meaningful relationship that I had in my life. And I uh, eventually made my way across the country uh, to Los Angeles, where I was trying to get a quick fix. And everyone in my life thought that they would find me dead in some ditch or on a street corner. And seven years ago, actually right around this time, um, I had a phone call with my mom where she said, I, I believe, I believe you can get help. Uh, and as a result of Medicaid and access to Medicaid, uh, I was able to get into treatment Thanksgiving Eve 2014 um, and get on medication assisted treatment and it saved my life. Tell us more about your cross country trip to meet with families impacted by addiction as well. In the summer of 2016, my best friend and I had rented a 35 foot RV and we drove across the country, across 22 states, logged over 8,000 miles over 30 days. And we wanted to visit communities. We wanted to go into homes of, of people who had lost loved ones to Oxycontin and other substances. We went into jails, recovery centers. We met with members of Congress. At the beginning of this trip, I had no idea who the Sackler family was, or and the only thing I knew about Purdue Pharma was it was a name on the side of a pill bottle that I had used for you know well over a decade previously. And I got home from that trip and decided that I was going to get involved. And I had set my sights and my eyes on Purdue and on the family that created Purdue and controlled Purdue, the Sackler family, from the beginning of my advocacy. In 2018, um, I led the largest protest in front of Purdue Pharma uh, to demand accountability from the family, um, asking the company to divest their profits into treatment, prevention, harm reduction, recovery supports uh, through a letter to their CEO, Craig Landau. And so in 2019, when Purdue Pharma filed for bankruptcy and got this uh, you know, golden parachute, uh, per se, uh, I was kind of this natural target by the Department of Justice uh, to be appointed to this committee that would serve as a watchdog um, in the Purdue Pharma bankruptcy that would participate in all the depositions that would review the millions of pages of discovery and ultimately evaluate the settlement, uh, working with state attorneys general uh, and, and, you know, several thousand creditors. But certainly, Today, in 2021, the ground has shifted beneath us as to what this overdose crisis looks like. 
it is way bigger than Purdue. It is way bigger than the Sacklers, and we have our work cut out for us. Well, kudos to you, Ryan, for going to the source and not stopping just there, continuing to peel back all the layers. When we come back, Ryan came face to face with the Sackler family himself. That's next. You don't want to miss it. Coming up, if you want to know what evil really looks like, have a Zoom call with a member of the Sackler family. Plus, the FDA was complicit and remains complicit today to the overdose crisis. Then, the Sacklers will never see a day in jail. They are going to skate by. This is what we call billionaire justice in the United States. That's coming up. Peeling back the layers of the worst drug epidemic in American history, orchestrated by the Sackler family of Purdue Pharma and their drug, OxyContin. Ryan, you were the only victim that actually had a face-to-face -face meeting with a member of the Sackler family. Tell us about that. If you want to know what evil really looks like, have a Zoom call with a member of the Sackler family. Um, David Sackler contended that there was no more money for victims. Um, at the time, they had offered $3 billion uh, in the settlement, and Sackler said that they would rather go to litigation than put another uh, single dollar into the settlement. When I got off that Zoom call, I realized how little power we had as victims, that the system had been set up from the beginning to favor people like the Sackler family, to favor people like David Sackler, no matter what crimes they committed, he knew he was going to get off. He knew that they were going to walk away. Um, so it was, it was maddening. You know, I think that it's notable to know too that you know the Sackler family is putting four and a half billion dollars into this settlement, but out of the settlement, victims are only taking seven and a half percent of that. The government and corporations are taking 92.5% of that money. The average family will only receive $5,000 at best, right? It, 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 it's a crime in itself. Well, Ryan, clearly we share in your outrage. How do you think the FDA played a role in America's opioid epidemic? Well, listen, the FDA was complicit and, in my opinion, remains complicit today on many issues specific uh, to the overdose crisis. The FDA really changed the game, right? When they approved the black box warning with this uh, statement called the delayed absorption uh, statement, which you know said that um, delayed absorption of Oxycontin into the bloodstream um, reduced the liability of addiction. It allowed Purdue to make that less than 1% claim of people becoming addicted. But if you know the full story, Purdue essentially wrote that statement, right? Purdue came up with that claim. Dr. Curtis Wright, uh, who was an FDA officer uh, responsible for the new drug approval for Purdue, um, allowed Purdue to come to Rockville, Maryland, rent a hotel room, and work with him to write the NDA, also known as the new drug approval. Curtis Wright went on to work for Purdue after leaving the FDA at a job of making almost $400,000 a year. It's corruption at the best. But even today, while the FDA is quick to approve new opioids, they are very, very slow to approve new innovations for addiction treatment drugs. It is maddening. Dominic, I don't remember pseudo addiction from medical school. I don't know what that means or what that is. To me, that's pulling the wool over uh, consumers. This was brilliant in an evil, devious, diabolical way. If you think about it as a physician, you're seeing your patients start to show signs of addiction. And now you're questioning that. You're like, wait a second. Maybe this 1% thing isn't correct here. So finally, you're giving a little pushback. But then all of a sudden, there's this term pseudo addiction. And they say, well, wait a second. It's actually just people that are having breakthrough pain. And all you need to do, guess what? Up the dose. Oh, my God. 
Pseudo addiction has never been verified empirically as a phenomenon. But listen, here's the truth. When you have pain, the way that opioids work is they will alleviate your pain by binding to those opioid receptors. But of course, we know that your receptors will downregulate over time and you will eventually have pain again. If these opiates are used in a chronic fashion, of course, you're going to have pain again. So when does the cycle ever end? It would continue and continue and continue. And we saw that because Purdue kept just coming out with new formularies of higher doses, 40, 60, 80, 120, right? It's like diabolical genius. It's, it's so incredibly yeah. frightening. Well, it is. They create, they, they came up with their own science, pseudoscience, I'm going to call it, that s suited their needs as far as selling more drugs and getting more people legitimately addicted to the medications. And we reached out to Purdue for comment, but did not receive a response. The FDA had this to say about its role in the ongoing opioid crisis. It's long been a priority for the FDA to respond to the opioid crisis. The FDA will continue working to use our regulatory authorities along with innovative approaches to address the many complexities contributing to the public health burden of drug misuse, abuse, overdose, and deaths. You can read the full response on our website at thedoctorstv.com. After the break, we'll dig deeper into the evolution of the opioid crisis. Stay tuned. Coming up. There was a doctor who was selling controlled substances to kids. 16 of his patients had died of overdoses. Then the Sacklers will never see a day in jail. They are going to skate by. This is what we call billionaire justice in the United States. That's coming. We're back with advocate and Purdue Pharma insider Ryan Hampton dissecting what caused the worst drug epidemic in history. Let's dig deeper into the evolution of the opioid crisis with former New York City prosecutor and author of Bad Medicine, Charlotte Bismuth. Welcome to the show, Charlotte. Thank you very much for having me, and I'm honored to be on with Ryan. Well, it, it's our honor as well. Charlotte, you were behind a criminal case against a dirty doctor who was getting people hooked on opioids. So what made you pursue this particular case and this particular doctor? So we received a tip from a brave young man who came forward and said that there was a doctor who was selling controlled substances to kids. Unfortunately, we quickly realized as we reviewed prescriptions and did research into this doctor that he presented a danger to the public. Tell us how you conducted your investigation in this case. So we had access to prescription records. We conducted surveillance. We did hours of surveillance. More importantly, we interviewed countless patients, family members when a patient had been deceased, and also other doctors who had treated the same patients. We set up an overdose alert system with the local medical examiner's office. That way, we learned that 16 of his patients had died of overdoses, which was just a staggering, staggering thing to learn. And tell us about the big break in your case. On Father's Day 2011, a young man went into a pharmacy in Medford, Long Island, and shot four people in cold blood. And it became known as the Father's Day Massacre. He was there to rob the pharmacy because he needed more of the pills that it turned out Dr. Lee had been prescribing to him without any medical basis. So at that point, it became a race against time to shut him down. In what ways did money influence Dr. Lee's illegal activity? Money was the driver. He was a predator. He preyed on the suffering of others. Ryan mentioned earlier the database that physicians can use to check if patients are doctor shopping. When Dr. Lee saw that his patients were seeing other doctors and getting controlled substances, he charged them more. It was an all cash business. He deposited thousands of dollars in cash every week into multiple bank accounts. We traced back approximately $500,000 worth of profits. And he exploited the pain of others. Um, ultimately, he, you know, he did go to prison 
but the amount of money that he made from the suffering and the death was unimaginable. Yeah, I mean, if you were to think of this as like a cartel, though, right, at the during the time frame that Charlotte's talking about, you would really put the Sacklers in, in, in with respect to these pharmaceuticals and these pill mills and these bad doctors, kind of the Sacklers at the top of the cartel, right? The Sackler family had the data and the knowledge that this was happening and they incentivized it and they called these doctors super whales and they sent sales reps down there to try and get them to do more and they came up with junk science to support it. And still today in 2021, I have more friends that I know of who have been locked up for being the victim of these bad doctors than the doctors themselves. And not to mention the fact that the Sacklers will never see a day in jail. They have not been indicted by the DOJ. They are gonna skate by and it is it is maddening. This is this is what we call billionaire justice in the United States. They blame these deaths on us, on my friends, and these people walk free. And thank you. And my hat is off to Charlotte for getting Dr. Lee put into prison where he belongs. But that doesn't happen enough. And it's certainly not happening to the Sackler family. I guess with Dr. Lee, Charlotte, he died in prison. Is that correct? That is correct. You know, it, it was justice for him to go to prison. Unfortunately, he died of COVID in prison, which I wouldn't wish on anyone, but I couldn't agree more with Ryan. As a prosecutor, I really believe in equal justice. I really believe in the law. And, you know, seeing Purdue Pharma and the Sacklers walk away has really shaken me. I can't imagine a more vulnerable population to exploit. A population of individuals that have a physiologic and psychological addiction that is stronger than anything they've ever experienced in their lives. Remember, when those opiate receptors get bound, that euphoria is part of it. The tolerance is part of it, meaning the disgusting and horrific withdrawals where you're horribly sick. But add one more thing to this from a neuroscientific perspective. It alters your dopamine reward system that what all that you think about is getting this substance. Now you have these sociopathic individuals that see dollar signs and they have this vulnerable captive audience to exploit for money. I, it's, and the Sackler family dangling that carrot it's, in front of it's, them. It's really horrific. And you know what, Ryan said a word and I'm trying to think of like, I, I don't even have the words here, but Ryan said maddening, right? I'm, I'm saying frustrated and disgusted and, and Ryan said maddening and he's right. It's, it's just maddening. It really is. Well, thank you so much for your, your input, Charlotte. After the break, we'll peel back the layers of medication assisted rehab for addiction. Stay tuned. Coming up, medication-assisted treatment for people who have opioid use disorder heals the brain. Plus, when I treat people with something like Suboxone and I taper them off, I see less relapse. I see them getting back to work. I see them raising their families. Then, we've lost six family members to opioid addiction. That's coming up. When you... unraveling the fallout of the opioid crisis with advocate and author Ryan Hampton. So Ryan, you credit medication-assisted therapy for helping you get sober, but why do you say others aren't so lucky? Well, I, I mean, part of my, my story was I had gone to treatment six times, right? Over the course of eight years, never offered medication-assisted treatment. And this last time when I was able to get it, it saved my life. Medication-assisted treatment for people who have opioid use disorder heals the brain. It gives them a better outcome. We know that the science is there, yet still today, well over half of addiction treatment facilities here in the United States do not offer medication-assisted treatment in, in the form of buprenorphine or Suboxone as the gold standard. We have a long way to go in terms of reforming that system. But even in my story, when I got sober, right, back in 2014, 2015, in the second facility that I got transferred to, I had to have a doctor who prescribed it to me, who told me not to tell 
anyone at the treatment facility I was at that I was on it because if I did, they were going to kick me out because they saw it as just layering one drug on top of another drug and it was essentially a crutch. This is the stigma that exists against people who you use medication assisted treatment is why one of the reasons why we're peaking at 100,000 deaths today. We need to lower those barriers. We've got to get rid of that prejudice. We have a long way to go. Yep. Dominic, I know you're a believer. You do a lot of this every day in your practice. You believe that Suboxone definitely has a place. There's no doubt. So you have a you have a cohort of people that think that Suboxone reinforces addiction or replaces an illicit drug with a prescription, right? That's the thought. The fact is, when I first got out of fellowship training, I was very idealistic. I was very conservative. I was of that mindset. You know what? I, I'm not a I'm not comfortable with this. But let me tell you something. When I treat people with something like Suboxone and I taper them off, I see less relapse. I see them getting back to work. I see them raising their families. I see them going back to school. When I used to get people off quick or refuse to do Suboxone, they would relapse. I'd see them in the ER the next week, thankfully still alive, but sometimes overdosed. What kind of responsibility is that as a physician to turn somebody away from a treatment that will potentially save your life, especially nowadays, if you relapse, every single illicit substance that you use out there is like playing Russian roulette. And that also goes for the pills because the pills are being pressed by other substances. So for example, they take fentanyl and they put them in pills and press them. So even though you think you're getting a Percocet or an Oxy, it could be whatever that dealer's giving you. So Russian roulette when you're out there in the streets, if we can use this harm reduction model to help people, I mean, it's a no brainer. It really is. I mean, clearly I think we need to rethink how we are dealing with addiction using medication. So coming up, we'll hear from a mother with a harrowing story of loss. Coming up. We've lost six family members to opioid addiction. Then. Addiction treatment is seen as the stepchild of the American healthcare system. We have to change that. That's coming up. We are back dissecting the controversy surrounding drug recovery houses. Let's bring in Kathy, a mother with a history of opioid addiction in her family. Kathy, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So tell us, how many family members, in fact, have you lost due to opioids? We've lost six family members to opioid addiction. Um, most recently, one of our cousin's children um, at age 27 um, died in August of 2021. Um, and my Thomas, um, who's here with me today, um, he, um, passed away um, on Overdose Awareness Day, August 31st of 2018 at the age of 27. His addiction started in 2009. He was in a um, horrific motorcycle accident and he spent about 10 or 12 days in the burn unit at our local hospital. And um, he had severe road rash all over his back and his chest and his arms. And that's when his opioid addiction started. Tell us what happened at the last recovery house uh, where Thomas stayed at. Thomas went into a recovery house in um, June 15th of 2018. Um, he decided to go five hours from home. We thought it would be you know, a great idea. He wanted to rebuild his life, be away from people, places and things. He went into the recovery home. I went to visit him the week before he, he um, overdose. He had um, wanted to go on medication assisted treatment. He was struggling. The recovery home, the sober home did not want him to do that. They said he couldn't stay if he did that. Um, and his recovery community there that he was connected with when he got there also um, discriminated against him wanting to use medication assisted treatment. So um, he chose not to. Um, and the next week, um, he was found in his bed in the uh, sober home. He had had a fatal, um, you know, setback in his journey. So had he gotten a hold of, of drugs in the facility? I'm not sure. I believe so from what I've heard in that morning. You know, he made the last decision he would ever make in his life, unfortunately. And Kathy, we've been talking about medication-assisted uh, help with addiction. 
If your son had been on Suboxone, do you think he, he would still be alive today? Absolutely. Absolutely. We know it saves lives. We know it saves lives, yet we're not, we're still discriminating against it in so many ways, including within the recovery community itself. We'll dig deeper into the controversy surrounding medication-assisted detox after the break. Stay tuned. Coming up, addiction treatment is seen as the stepchild of the American healthcare system. We have to change that. Then, we have to learn from our mistakes. That's in today's Power Prescription. That's coming up. Thomas went into a recovery house June 15th of 2018. He wanted to go on medication assisted treatment. He was struggling. The recovery home, the sober home did not want him to do that. And the next week he was found in his bed. He had had a fatal, um, you know, setback in his journey. If your son had been on Suboxone, do you think he, he would still be alive today? Absolutely. We're back breaking down the controversy surrounding rehabilitation for opioid addiction. Dr. Sportelli, why are so many rehab centers reticent? They're against using medication assisted detox. You've, yeah. you've shown that it works. Yeah, Doc, you know, there seems to be this theme that abstinence is complete abstinence. There is this belief that anything that is in any way interfering or that they need in a dependent fashion is just off limits, is taboo. And again, they think it reinforces that addiction process or they're just replacing their illicit use with something else, with a prescription, as we said before. I'm, I'm but, sorry, Doc, but I, it sounds to me like that's <laughs> their business model, that these rehab centers, I alluded to it, a $30 billion business, guess what? They want the repeat business. Doc, can I, can I just say, though, I'm sorry, because this has been like one of the most contentious points of our advocacy and pushing since I got sober for the last seven years, right? It is, like you said, a $30 billion business. When I went to rehab, I went to, when there was no medication-assisted treatment, I ended up going to the same rehab. It was a revolving door. When you put medication assisted treatment and people get better and they don't become return customers guess what that business model it falls flat on its face it is unconscionable that we have a hundred thousand americans who have died of a drug overdose and still well over 50 percent of treatment facilities do not offer this it is a business model we have got to regulate and do a better job with addiction treatment centers. Addiction treatment is seen as the stepchild of the American healthcare system. We have to change that and we need to integrate it into primary care settings. People should be able to receive and have access to Suboxone the same way people can get vaccines today, anywhere, right? Like we need to lower that barrier. Ryan, I saw this with my own eyes. I'm telling you, I'm a changed person as a physician. I was so much more conservative with this stuff. And I was actually, in my early practice, in my young, idealistic, naive days, I actually thought, maybe they have a point. Maybe we should be abstinent from everything. But I told you what I saw. I saw relapses and death. And you know what? I will take any day harm reduction and safety and a monitored regimen, a safe monitored regimen of something that helps people stay clean any day over relapse and potential death. Absolutely. Well, that's the key, potential death. I mean, that, that number of the people that are dying is way, way too high. And it sounds like medication assisted uh, addiction rehabilitation is the key. And Kathy, before we go, any advice you have for parents trying to get their child into a recovery home? Absolutely. Um, do your homework, do research on it. Um, know what's happening. I thought that I knew and I didn't know. Um, the home that Thomas died in when he did have his fatal overdose had no naloxone or Narcan available um, to revive that fatal overdose. Um, you would think that a recovery home would automatically have that. Yes. I mean, that in itself is so egregious. I, I All I can do is shake my head. I mean, what are they doing? Yeah, They're dealing with opioid addiction and they don't have Narcan readily available. I mean, I you know, every single person that I prescribe the, you know, Suboxone or anything like that, I, I give them intranasal Narcan. And what I tell them is, I say, listen, 
put it in your pocketbook, put it in your car, put it in your glove compartment, because not only you may need it if you feel like you took too much or you relapsed, but someone you know, because people travel in the same circle. So Narcan's a lifesaver. I'm glad you brought that up. Absolutely. The more we have out and available, the better. Um, it's just absolutely imperative to have and to know what's happening. And in most states, anybody can, you know, tack up a tile and call themselves a recovery home. So make sure that, you know, you're doing your home. We need better regulations on, on these places, whether they're private pay or Medicaid funded, there needs to be regulations. Kathy, we are so sorry for your loss. Thank you again for sharing today on the show. Ryan, thank you for coming today. Your, all your insight, your experience, uh, very important stuff. Thank you. Thank you. For thank you all. Thank you. All right. Dr. Sportelli, thank you for joining us today. Doc, thanks so much for having me. And you know this one's personal to me with family members that have suffered and doing this daily at work. This is what you do. And, and today's show just shows that opioid addiction continues to be a huge problem.